Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for Gwinnett County Public Library's first ever social justice club. My name is Linda Huang and I'm a librarian at the Five Forks branch. And today we will be discussing Black American issues by examining Dr. Rayshawn Ray's article, What Does Defund the Police Mean and Does It Have Merit? Dr. Ray is a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, a professor of sociology, and executive director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research at the University of Maryland College Park. My lovely tech assistant, Manor, will be linking the article in the chat as well as any discussion questions. Uh, you can open the chat by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. If you don't see it, there are three little dots that you can click on that says more and you should be able to pull it up. Um, and I see that everyone is muted right now. When you're ready to speak, you can unmute. Um, otherwise, you can also type your responses in the chat if you're more comfortable doing that. And then I will read them out loud. So I just want to make an point uh, as librarians, we are information specialists here to simply bring you information and not persuade you of anything. And please be respectful of others. Um, so let's get started. I think Manor is going to post the discussion questions. Let's get started. So number one, uh, what does defund the police mean to you after reading this article? And like I said, feel free to unmute yourself whenever you're ready. Well, um, <laughs> for me, defund the police um, before and after reading this article is the reallocation of funds from police departments into the community instead of funding, you know, the police with all the money and all the weapons and, and, and all of that, you know, we can use some of those funds to um, work, work with the community better, you know, mental health services, social services, things like that. So that's what defund the police means to me. Thank you, Miriam. Anybody else? I would say that before uh, reading the article, uh, at the very beginning when all these protests started, I thought that defund the police actually meant to really just take away money from the police department. Um, but after reading the article and realizing that, yes, they used some of the money that would have been for the police department, but actually using it for other services that perhaps would be of better use um, to help, like Marion said, on the community with mental services and so on, that for me, it's even better. So I, I learned something <laughs> by reading the article. Yeah, thank you, Lennon. Um, yeah, when you first hear a defund the police, it seems like kind of a shocking thing. And it, in some instances, it was used as kind of a fear tactic that, you know, all hell is going to break loose, essentially, because we're not going to have police um, to protect us. Um, there was an article, a New York Times opinion article that um, the writer had linked, and I thought it was interesting. It said... Um, Instead, healthcare workers or emergency response teams would handle these incidents. So if someone calls 911 to report a drug overdose, healthcare teams rush to the scene. The police wouldn't get involved. If a person calls 911 to complain about people who are homeless, rapid response social workers would provide them with housing support and other resources. Um, and it kind of goes on and on giving specific examples. So like, instead of calling 911, you would call like a 727 number or something like that. And um, that would bring you a whole set of um, like conflict resolution um, responses instead of just police. And again, it's not getting rid of the police. It's, you know, just working in tandem, um, having separate sets working with people, you know, so we still have that protection in violent instances. And kind of going along with that, the second question is, do you feel that the term defund appropriately represents what the movement hopes to achieve? So you guys can go ahead and say whatever you think. So the author says, so while the word reallocate may be more of a palatable 
digestible word on the House floor or at a city council meeting, defund surely gets more attention on a protest sign. Can you guys think of another word that might work better or would be more effective um, and more accurate in describing the movement? Um, We had someone in the chat say police reform instead of defunding the police. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good option. Do you think that the term police reform has enough oomph to get people's attention? I think that it does. But like the article said, defund the police, it definitely creates a reaction, as you see, as as we've seen the past year, and it's a strong reaction. So I, I don't know, I really, I really, you know, I don't know what the perfect language would be for, for this, but police reform definitely and I know I, I, I've had I've heard police reform being thrown out there as well you know are are we willing to take a look at police departments across the country and, and really do the work I think that there's just this this just deep and old culture of how police work you know definitely it's going to take some time it's going to take a lot of work to make the, those changes and I, I found it interesting what you were saying about the, the article from the New York Times about, you know, sending social services, you know, if, if somebody were to call in um, about a homeless person. But I wonder, you know, would that fall on the community? Are we going to have to learn like different numbers or is this going to fall on the 911 operators and they would be the ones to dispatch dispatch you know, those specific uh, services to whatever calls are coming in. Yeah, I was wondering about that as well, Miriam. That's a very good point. Yeah, my, my other concern with that would be, like you said, if it falls on the dispatcher and they're trying to determine what if they, you know, there's always room for error there. Like what if they choose the wrong organization to contact and it does escalate regardless and someone from one of these other organizations is put in danger. Uh, it's it's hard to say. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, but there's definitely a lot that needs to be evaluated, a lot that needs to be studied before we can implement something, um, you know, nationwide. I think that, um, I mean, defund the police creates or at least created a lot of confusion at the beginning. And yes, maybe an, a different word would be better. But uh, now that you're talking about who would get to the place um, where the action is happening, I don't know about, I haven't had um, any, any experience here in Winnet in terms of having an emergency, thankfully. Um, but there are some places where regardless of what your emergency is, the police gets there, the firemen get there, and then the ambulance gets there. So I think that even if it would be a need for a social service, that the police could still get there and just in, in case, just in case, but not as the first person that the customer needing the help would, would come in contact with. Uh, so the police could be just a backup in case something happens, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think that might be a good plan there, um, you know, just in case, but kind of, you know, training the police officers to kind of stand back and just be, you know, observant of what's going on and, um, you know, determining if the situation, you know, if they actually need to be there or not. I think that's, that's a really, really good idea. So I guess we'll move on. How does this movement inform the Capitol insurrection that occurred on January 6th? Or how do you view the points made by the author after witnessing how police officers handled these protests versus how they handled the Black Lives Matter protests in the summer. If you have any commentary on that, I'd be really interested to hear. I feel like there was obviously a kind of bias that happened there versus uh, when you look at the Black Lives Matter protests that happened last summer versus the insurrection that happened last month. I think it's really clear to see that the only difference that was between those two groups was their race and how the security at the Capitol 
seemed like they basically just let them in and let them walk right in and do whatever they wanted to um, versus using, of course, extreme and brutal force with Black Lives Matter protesters. So I didn't really like that to say, to put it lightly, really. Um, But I'd be curious to see what everyone else thinks about it. Yeah, very good points, Manor. Um, Anybody else want to comment on that? Um, I feel the same way as Manor. Uh, it's it's like night and day, completely different uh, reactions to what happened. Yeah, and the language tends to be a lot different in reports, you know, the looting and all that other stuff. I don't know if they referred to the insurrection. They might, they might have as looting and all the damage to the property in the Capitol. You know, I know there are instances of police officers during the insurrection who did do their job, who did try to protect Um, But there was an overwhelming difference in how the majority, it seemed, uh, of police officers responded um, as opposed to the Black Lives Matter protests. And it's, it's very interesting. It's just a very interesting, I guess, anthropological study in a way because of social media and how everything was posted online, how we could basically view in real time what was happening in both instances. So it's, we live in a time where we're exposed to so much information at once that, you know, it's hard to keep up, first of all. And second of all, we're witnessing things that we never would have witnessed back in the day. So there are atrocities that have always gone on. And right now we are just able to view them that more, much more easily. Yeah, that's a question I have, you know, how do you feel like social media and technology has kind of influenced the the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements for that matter? I mean, I'm not a, such a social media user myself, but I'm glad that we do have social media because otherwise, like you said, we wouldn't be seeing the reality of these issues um, right when it's happening and see the difference in how politicians, how um, officials are handling these issues. I agree. Um, And when you mentioned politicians and, you know, anyone in charge, you know, we're able to hold them more responsible for their actions. And, you know, we can see who is doing something to make the world better and who is not, or making our country better at least, you know, it, it really makes you question, Do does the government really have our best interests at heart? <laughs> but that's a whole other um, conversation that we could get into. I think we'll move on to the last question, but then we can have an open discussion as well. Uh, should the focus of the movement be on reallocating funds to different governmental departments? Um, or community departments, or on more effective police training methods? uh, Or do you feel that the system is effective the way it is now? I mean, it's obvious that it's not effective (laughs) right now, uh, and that they need to make major changes. And of course, probably easier said than done, uh, because it will take probably a long time to figure out what's the best way to retrain or to reallocate funds and how to do things, but definitely there needs to be a change. At least that's what I think. I know I should probably remain impartial, but I, I do I do feel like there's always room for improvement in anything. I was just going to say, I think that, yes, there there needs to be a lot of training done for the police in order to change all of the grave misdoings that are happening. But allocating money towards social services that'll create lasting change in the community, I think is also very important. I know the Denver area started a program where um, depending on the 911 call, they would dispatch a mental health service worker instead. um, And they were able to take some of the pressure off the cops so that they could uh, focus more on the more intense situations. But then those people were still getting the help that they needed from someone they would probably consider less threatening and who has the training to be able to help them um, better. Yeah, very well said, Sydney, and thank you for that example from Denver. Um, Yeah, that's definitely a model um, 
all states could go after for sure. And like you said, alleviating some of the pressure off of the police department, um, because that is a, a big thing that was mentioned as well. You know, the police are overworked. It's often a thankless job. And, you know, we do have to empathize, sympathize with them because they are people. And I know there are good police officers and then there are not so good police officers and some are just complacent in in certain situations. But we do have to realize that anytime anyone's overworked, you know, their ability to empathize or, you know, effectively do their job is is, a risk. So yeah, thank you for bringing up those points. Anybody else want to comment? I feel like as an educator, we are trained to see the warning signs in our students. Like if a student has bruises, you immediately go to the counselor. If a student lets you know situations at home aren't that great, or if they don't have enough food, you go to the parent coordinator to see, do we have any extra clothes or can we get them in touch with certain resources that we have within the school community to see what we can do to help. So I feel like if teachers like me are trained to do these things, I feel like we can definitely do that with the government systems we have in place. If we have dispatchers who can be trained somewhat similarly, maybe even better on, okay, based on what I'm told about the situation, who do I need to dispatch? Or even on the point about effective police training methods. Sometimes I wonder, do we need to screen who we employ as a police officer? Do they have their own biases? can we maybe get them some mindfulness training so they're not as reactionary, they're able to take a step back and say, okay, what is the best way for me to approach this situation, if that makes sense. So I feel like, like you said as well, there's room for improvement everywhere. We could look at local examples within the country, maybe even see what other countries are doing in these kinds of situations, because we can always learn from each other. And there's always room for improvement. Yeah, that's what I have to say. No, all very great points. And yeah, thank you for, you know, bringing your personal experience into it. Because you said like, you know, you're you're an educator, but you are expected to do these other things as well um, to maintain the well-being of your students. And government organizations we have in place should be able to do that. Or police should be doing mindfulness training, as you said. And I know some police departments have started doing things like that. But I think a lot of the problem we have is we're such a huge country with so many municipalities and differences in the way we, you know, uphold the law, I guess you could say. There's a lot to consider. As far as dispatch goes, That this is kind of a little off topic, but I didn't realize that dispatch operators, um, some are really well trained and others are given no training before they're put into that position uh, because it's such a stressful job. And I guess in a lot of instances, you know, there's a high turnaround rate with them. So just like with any job that's really high stress, you know, they have difficulty keeping people in those positions. But, you know, it does take special people to do that kind of work. And I think part of making the situation better is identifying people who do have that more empathetic ability and realize that people are complex. You can't just bring violence into every situation or conflict into every situation and hope that it resolves. But Anything else regarding that? I also think that it's not only going to take a changing up training methods, um, reallocating funds, but I think it's also a change in the culture of policing. I think it's been a certain way for such a long time that that's going to be really hard to change. And, And I know that, you know, like I think you were mentioning, you know, police can be overworked too. And it's very hard to expect for them to go out, do their job, you know, protect, protect the community, look out for themselves, protect themselves as well. And then also expect for them to know how to deescalate somebody with mental health issues. It's a lot to ask of the police, I think, as well. So that's why I think it is a good idea to have those extra services that we could, you know, reallocate some of those funds to have those services come out instead of the police. Because I think it, you know, to expect them to do all of that, I think it can get tough. And maybe they don't always make the best choices or, you know, they're, at the end of the day, they are going to look out for themselves, for their, their life. So I, 
I don't know. I um, I definitely think it's going to take a, a lot more than than training and reallocating funds. Yeah, yeah. I think you're probably right on that. There's no, there's no one answer. There's no one answer. And, and like you said, there's so many municipalities and they all run a certain way. We, you know, it, it's, it's not all the same across the board. So it's, it's definitely a huge task, but um, we got to start somewhere. Right. We absolutely do have to start somewhere. We can't just maintain the status quo. It looks like Gina in the chat says it also depends on the police department because each individual one is trained differently and operates differently across all the country. I learned that when I read the book, Welcome to the United States of Anxiety. I will have to read that. Has anyone else read that? Or can you tell me more about that, Gina? Don't know if I can like summarize it. It's like meant to be like funny, sort of but in a very serious way. I gotcha. I the book, it's, it's, it's like, it's dealing with like different social issues around the United States. And it talks about police reform and the issues with police reform because every department is not the same and they're not trained the same, which is why you'll see in Denver, they're trying to uh, do police reform by bringing out social workers and you'll see that not every single de- police department is doing the exact same thing. Thank you, Gina. Yeah, absolutely. That's something we have to consider. I mean, do you think it's plausible to think that every police department around the country uh, would be willing to adopt new practices or have kind of a standard nas- nationwide? Do you think that's possible? That would definitely take a top-down change. So... The leadership of that department would have to adopt that in order for that to actually happen. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And that can be tricky in certain parts of the country. I know, you know, we're so divided right now, especially politically and in our ideals. It's kind of disheartening. (laughs) You know, I, I wonder if we'll be able to achieve what we want. At least this group seems to want, um, with police reform, But again, I think we have to try and, you know, we continue to strive to make things better. I was just going to comment that I really only see that happening in like your major metropolitan cities, because in like smaller cities, towns, I just really don't see that. And if it's not part of the culture of where they're located, then I don't see that being a priority for those departments. So I really... I really do see that happening eventually in like the major metropolitan cities across the country, you know, possibly Atlanta PD, but do I really see that, you know, even in, um, I, c- I can't remember the, um, the police department, what was his name? Aubrey down in South Georgia. Um, Waycross. Ahmad Arbery. Um, Ahmad Arbery. I mean, yeah, that was major, major national news. So maybe it would happen now. But, you know, who knows what they've been doing all this time. There's other little cities like that all across the country. And would they be willing to do to change? I do see that happening in just like the major, major cities. Yeah. Hope for more, <laughs> but it does seem like the reality of it. What does everyone else think? I think that with any change, there's always people who who do not want to see things changing, who oppose to changes. So it will take more time that we would like to, but I do see some of the benefits that even the police departments themselves or police officers themselves could have out of reallocating these funds because I think that even the police officers might also need to get some or have some access to some type of therapy. Uh, we Sometimes we hear about police officers that abuse alcohol or drugs and they are not tested uh, on a consistent basis and maybe their alcohol abuse is due to all the pressure and stress that their jobs create and I mean I, I do see some of the benefits of that they 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 would uh, receive from these uh, reallocation of funds but it will it will take longer than I would like to for those changes to to take place. Yeah, it's it's going to take quite some time. I was listening to a podcast recently. It 
it's from the perspective of the police officer and it's about crime in small towns and they talk about the emotional toll that some of these more severe crimes have taken on on them personally and you know some their particular department would offer therapy i mean it's not a it's not a lot of therapy but they said that it, in a lot of instances, it's not as effective as talking to someone else who was there who experienced that same thing. And then they were talking about the suicide rate of police officers as well. So on that side of things, you know, it's it's not perfect. But again, we can't look past the things that have been brought to our attention and the injustices against Black Americans Hispanic Americans, basically anyone, <laughs> but it's, it's really tough. And I'm going to go ahead and put a link to an article that CNN published. I think it was today. No, it was yesterday. And it says President Joe Biden said at a CNN town hall on Tuesday that he remains opposed to calls for defunding the police. He said in response to a question about how to avoid overly constraining police while addressing racial disparities, Biden replied by number one, not defunding the police. And it says that he published criminal justice plan that called for a $300, $300 million investment in community policing efforts, including the hiring of more officers. His transition team met with the Fraternal Order of Police in November and has met with other groups representing law enforcement since. How do we feel about that? Just based off of what you read, I personally wouldn't agree that we need to hire more officers when I think that's only going to escalate the problem. I think the idea of community policing, I think implemented correctly, could be um, good for certain communities, but without like drastic changes to just the police force in general and how they approach different situations, um, I don't think that adding police officers would necessarily fix the issue. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Again, I think, you know, funding other organizations to help um, would be more of the answer. Trying to see if there's anything else in the article and feel free to look through. Oh, looks like Ashley made a comment here. Going back to Linda's question about social media and the Black Lives Matter movement, on one hand, there have been some excellent resources that have been shared by activists and thought leaders on Twitter and Instagram especially. On the other hand, there's also quite a bit of misinformation being spread on social media as well. Yeah, yeah, misinformation, not fact checking. It's so easy to get riled up by something you see on one of these social media platforms without doing your homework. And that's where the danger comes in. So I have to remind myself constantly, you know, okay, let's, let's look this up. Let's see if this is real. Let's make sure I'm not going to help the spread of misinformation. I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but I know Lennon said she doesn't really use social media too much, but I'm sure you see some things online that can kind of sway you one way or the other. Does anyone just have any comments or anything they'd like to express or maybe something that they've read recently that they'd like to share? I was just going to say that social media can definitely trigger a lot of uh, anxiety and from all sides. I mean, like you said, you, you really have to be careful on what you observe because it could be misinformation or it could be real facts. But either way, it can also cause some anxiety. And even if you want to stay neutral until you do either your own research to find what is true or wait until things have developed a little bit more to find out more information is definitely creating more anxiety, I would say, in our society. Yeah, definitely more anxiety. And I, I think it, it's a big contributor to the divisiveness of our times as well. And it always seems like we have to pick a side. We can't have a conversation. We can't try to see other viewpoints. And I, I think that's a huge problem because people are complex. Their ideals are complex. Their beliefs and values are, you know... We don't know people's past traumas or how they've been affected by certain things and why they have certain biases. So we have to, you know, take that into account, but, you know, don't lose sight of the goal at the end. It's really, it's a really tough time right now. And with COVID, with all the violence we've seen, you know, this past year, it's, it's, it's depressing, but I'm glad that at least we can have this discussion. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, you know, without yelling at each other, um, calling each other names, because I don't think that gets us anywhere personally. We have about 15 minutes left. If you want to discuss anything else, do you want to let you know that we'll be holding these sessions every other month for the next year, at least. Our next session is Thank you, Menorah. <laughs> it's April 15th at 6.30 p.m. Um, and we'll be discussing the article, Hate Crimes Against Asian Americans Are Nothing New. Um, you will have to register through our website and you can call us or you can go straight to our website the calendar. It's not quite up yet, but we will be putting that up fairly soon. All right. Well, I hope everyone got a little bit of something out of our discussion tonight. I thought it was very interesting. I hope you'll join us next time and I hope you all have a good evening.